Syndication, whether it's YouTube or Simulcast, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Chris Hyde. You know, I was talking to old Sam that goes like this. To gain is to understand. To understand is to learn. You know, that's a phrase that always has stuck to me. Uh, no matter what. But the key part in that whole sentence is understand. You know, you can't understand something until you learn something or put it into practice. You know, tonight's entire show, especially the lesson tonight, all deals with, you know, what does understanding come from? You know, even though the Bible says, you know, I, I look to the hills, you know, where my help is. My help comes from God. But also, another one that kind of backs all that up is, you know, the verse of Malachi that talks about, you know, God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, you can't have knowledge without understanding can't understand something if you don't learn. Courtesy of our seniorly pastor, Brian Adams, tonight's lesson all deals with one more understanding. So we suggest you get your pen, the paper, and if you're at the church Bible study and you're joining us on the simulcast, sit on down, make sure you get some in-depth notes on this one. Because it all deals with one word, understanding. Pastor, it's all yours. Let's go resonate. But God is so good. Hey, if, if, if you, you, you ever try to understand something, and sometimes you just can't figure it out, it's kind of like when you get that stuff that you got to put together at Christmas, and they give you directions, and you're like, wow, I don't need directions. And then you have that extra part, and you're like, oh, now I understand why I needed that, right? When I was a kid, my dad used to, he used to say something all the time, and, and it cracked me up. You guys got to see Dad in his heydays. But back when he was younger, man, he was cut and dry. <laughs> kind of like Pastor, amen. And, and uh, oh, I remember one time, man, we were working on the truck, and he, uh, he told me something, but I didn't understand. So I kind of went to do it my own way. And y'all you know how Aunt Pam slaps some of you in the back of the head sometimes? Well, that, she got that from my dad, amen? And he was like, did you not understand what I was saying? And I was like, well, I thought I could do it this way. And he goes, that ain't the way I wanted it done. And I'm like, I guess I didn't have an understanding. Hello. Some of you are going through some things in your life right now, and you don't understand why. You don't understand why it's been delayed. You don't understand why it's so difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Don't understand the circumstance. Don't understand. So today we're preaching understanding. And we're going to break down some things and teach you a little bit. Listen, this is one of the most familiar stories in the Bible. And you can already go ahead and turn to John 11. But I want you to understand something. When it comes to understanding, the source of our understanding doesn't come from us. And, and, and that's the big key, okay? We've got to learn to get self out of the way in every area. But one of the main areas that you've got to get self out of the way of is understanding. See, 
The source of understanding don't come from us, but it comes from God. Amen. Hello. Amen. He, 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 he performs or he profounds understanding inside of us. There's times like, oh, man, I'll give you an example. I, I, I couldn't understand why my mom had to die so early. That's just mind-blowing to me. I was a mama's boy. And, and mama leaving so early just crushed me. Hello. And I didn't understand how to handle that. And then I couldn't understand. Check this out. Why dad, being a pastor and a minister for 40 years, would have dementia and then the last three months didn't even know his son's, his favorite son. <laughs> anyway, didn't even know his son's name. Right? And I couldn't understand that. And, I, and that bugged me. Hello? And I prayed and I caught myself praying, Lord, I don't understand why you're taking my mom while I'm so young. But you notice I didn't say, I didn't understand why you were taking my mom. I made it about me. And then even when I prayed over my dad, I was like, I don't understand how you can do that to a man of God and then expect this young man of God to have the same faith knowing that I could be like that. I didn't understand God's understanding. See, we need to understand something about Jesus real quick. Let me kind of give you a base. See, Jesus, and you need to understand this, he chose to understand human weakness the same way many of us have come to understand weakness in our own lives. Ain't that right? Come on. And I'll explain it. He fully entered into the weakness of his own. He became one of us. God became flesh in Jesus. Hello, somebody. And I want to talk about the love of God before I even go real far. I want to break this down. You know, sometimes we don't realize the love that God has for us. We, we know he died for our sins. Come on. And, and I don't mean to overplay that or nothing, but sometimes, man, we just get focused on that, but we don't realize the true love of God. He not only loved us enough to give his son for our sins, but he loved us enough to become flesh. Come on, somebody. So he can experience some of our emotions, so he can experience some of our pains, so he can experience some of our grief, and we don't realize that. In my opinion, we don't teach that enough because we just like, well, he's this God. He's just Jesus. It should just be this way. But, but there's more to him than what we make him. See, we cookie cut him. We make it where, oh, he's only going to supply our needs and it's only for forgiveness or healing. But that's not so. He loved us so much that he wanted to know what it felt like. That's powerful, y'all. He wanted to know what it felt like for us to go through some things. So, I, I mean, that's just, that's just beautiful. So, when you think that he took on flesh, I want you to look at it a different way. Can we, oh, can we teach you a little bit? He took on our weakness. Our weakness in every area. Our weakness of our mind, that our thoughts get crazy, come on. Our weakness where we doubt. Our weakness in pains and struggles, he, he took it on. See, in other words, Jesus was like us. He experienced the deep human fulfillment through deep abiding friendships. Everyone say friendships. This is beautiful, y'all. Check this out. Like anyone else, he had people that he uniquely poured into, but at the same time, you also find out that Jesus had people that poured into him. Yeah. He, he, took it, he took it on to us to the point that he even wanted friendships. And not only did he pour into his trail disciples, but if you really study that out, the trail disciples poured back into him. Look at John. You know, John, John had a, John, if I was Jesus, John would bug me. I'd be like, get your head off my chest. Come on, somebody. But, but he was so, he would pour into Jesus because Jesus needed to feel that love and affection too. And then he needed to have a little bit to understand why Peter would get mad and chop an ear off. Come on. He needed, he needed to understand that because if you don't have true feelings and if he didn't take on our weakness, how would he be able to forgive us in the fullness? And that's what's beautiful. So no matter what you're going through, the struggle and the difficulty, Jesus actually went through it in the physical so he can complete you. And that's beautiful, man. We don't ever paint that picture, but that's beautiful. Because he just didn't die for my sins and for my healings. He didn't, he, he's like, no, 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 no. I came on to feel what you're going through so that way I know how to love you perfectly. And that's beautiful. So like us, he had friendships that poured into him. And one of those great friendships that he had was a man named Lazarus. We all know the story of Lazarus, but most people don't study on Lazarus. When you study on Lazarus, you find out that Jesus, when you study, and I study, y'all, I, I don't just study, I study Greek, Hebrew, and, and I, Jewish books, I study everything, because I want to know Jesus. Come on. You'll find out that Jesus ate at his house more than he ate at anyone else's house. That's a friendship. 
I like some of you all, but I ain't eating your cooking. Now, Sister Stone, I'll eat her cooking as long as Tanner ain't cooking it. Amen? Because we all know he'll burn a hot dog. Praise God. But, but in reality, I want you to understand, he thought so much of him that Jesus stayed with him all the time. And Jesus, every time he would come into town, he's like, I'm going to Lazarus. Hey, Jesus, you want to stay with me? Man, I would, but I'm hanging with my boy Lazarus. That's beautiful. It's beautiful because it shows us not only that he wants to rule over us, but he wants us to be his friend. Right? So Lazarus was Jesus' friend. He wasn't just a random spectator. He wasn't just a random person that the writers picked in the story of Jesus. This was his friend. In other words, he wasn't just another face in the crowd. And I want to build here for a minute. You need to understand Jesus is with you every day. He eats with you probably more than he ate, eats with Lazarus. You're going to say, he, I never seen him eat. He's with you everywhere you go. Come on, somebody. And he call, what gets me is Jesus even calls you his friends. Not servants, not peasants, not equals, but friends. And that's beautiful. And I'm, I'm trying to paint a picture here because I'm going to tell you a story about Lazarus in a way you ain't never seen it. Because sometimes some of you don't understand why you're waiting. Sometimes you don't understand why you're not getting your miracle now. Why things just ain't happening that quick. And what it is, when we get to this story, is Jesus is trying to show you, I've been through them experiences, and you won't learn or know who I am without them. That's very important. You hear me? So we find out that all of a sudden we know the story. We're going to go to John 11, 1 through 6. But we find out all of a sudden that Martha and Mary find out that their brother is sick. Now, a certain man was sick, and his name was Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and his sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with the ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now, let's talk about that. You, you ever wonder why that was in there? It wasn't just to recognize all the 500 Marys in the Bible. Come on. It was because he was saying, hey, I want you to realize how close I was to this man. This, is, this man that is my friend, his, his sister's the one that rushed into the room where a woman shouldn't have been in. She like bent down behind me while I was eating and my feet was on the back side because they sat when they eat. They ain't like us, you know, Leslie blowing it up, right? But she, and she took the, we all know, man, she anointed his feet to the alabaster box and she cried and then she let her hair down symbolizing that she was giving herself to Jesus and she dries his feet. So this is here to tell us in this story that this, this ain't nobody. This is one of my favorite people. That's beautiful. Go next verse, please. Therefore his sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, him who thou what? Is sick. Well, first off, let's, before we go far, you need to understand God loves you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Come on, somebody. So he loves you. I know that there's times that you think God ain't paying no attention to you. I know that there's times that you just think that he don't really love me. He just wants me to do this and that. You ever been there? Come on. But I want you to understand this story is so beautiful because the one that you lovest, the one that we know you love him, Lord, that's, that's powerful. So realize today that God loves you and realize he loves you unconditionally to the point that he calls you his friends, to the point that you're his everything. The Bible says to God that you're the apple of his eye. Come on, somebody. Can I take it a little farther? I believe that we're the heartbeat of Jesus. Come on, somebody. But, and that's beautiful, but check this out. Next verse, please. You go to 4. It says, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death. Now, this confuses people. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Because we're like, well, we all know him will die. Come on. But, but what is really death? And who controls death? So let's teach. But the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now listen, check this out. So what he's telling them is, he goes, hey, you all think this sickness is for him to die, but really this sickness is to glorify the Heavenly Father. Can we teach real quick? That means you're struggling the things that you're going through. It ain't to bring you down. It ain't to make you miserable. It's to make you glorify the Father. God didn't give you a sickness just to make you feel miserable. He gave you a sickness because in the middle of your sickness, God's going to be glorified. You're going to, come on somebody. He didn't give you a struggle. He didn't give you a hard time so you can just be miserable and feel sick in your stomach. He said there's a bigger picture. Can we teach? There's a bigger understanding than what you know. That's powerful. 
So to their understanding, and I'm going to go through this, to their understanding, they thought, man, this sickness is to death. They couldn't see the Romans 8 and 28, the good in the middle of everything. See, our understanding don't level up to God's understanding. See, to Jesus' understanding, which was God in the flesh, he's saying, you know what? (laughs) This ain't even really about the death. This is about going and find the Father. Five says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now listen, any time that something's mentioned twice, it's important. So again in this story, this is personal. He's like, look, man, I love them, but this ain't about the death. He's even saying, this ain't about you guys. Hey, listen, some of us need to learn that what we're facing ain't about us. It's about the Father. Come on, somebody. So you got to understand, he's saying, hey, I love them and all, but this ain't about them. This is cool. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abided two days still in the same I'm sorry, I'm laughing. He abided two days still in the same place. Now, I, I, I don't know about you, but have you ever felt like Jesus is taking his own sweet time taking care of something? Hello? Well, picture this. Here's, his, be- here's the, his best friend's dying. This is the sister that had known him. This is the one that he loves. He's at his house all the time. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure Martha and Murray thought, hey, he's going to be here any day. But if you notice, he tarried. Now, that's kind of disappointing, but if we're really honest with one another, we get tired of Jesus' tarrying sometimes. Even better, sometimes we don't understand why Jesus is tarrying. Because we don't understand Jesus' understanding. That's good. You all with me this morning? Because, see, there's a number of you this morning that just about to give up and don't see things going to change and don't understand why it ain't getting no better. And you're trying to get, you're trying to like, see it through your understanding and God's like I'm delaying for a reason there's a purpose that I'm slowing down come on somebody that's beautiful so check this out man he says this hey there's a, there's there's something I'm going to wait I'm going to hang back now I don't know about you but let's let's just put ourselves in Mary and Martha's don't you know they felt cold don't you know they didn't understand or maybe didn't even think Jesus understand how serious this sickness was or this situation was Yet, ironically enough, now check this out, ironically enough, understanding seemed to be precisely Jesus' purpose through this whole story. And it was his purpose on a broader scale. Everyone say broader scale. I'm not knocking what you're going through. I'm telling you, you're looking at it from physical or flesh understanding, and Jesus is looking at it on a broader scale of spiritual understanding. That makes sense? See, sometimes we got to stop trying to look at things in our eyes and start looking and say, hey, Lord, I don't understand the sickness. I don't understand the delay, but I'm fine with you being delayed. Come on, somebody. See, Jesus unapologetically, unapologetically wanted to embrace the kind of understanding so he could gain only from the loss of his friend. Now, think about that. That's beautiful. We, we look at it as he was being delayed and being stubborn, but really, Jesus is like, I need to know how they feel when they grieve. Because if I'm going to heal them completely, and if I'm going to get rid of their depression, and if I'm going to take all their pain and everything to the cross, I need to have an understanding of it. Changes Jesus. He wasn't doing it to show both that he was God. He was doing it so when you come to pray, he can honestly say, I understand. I've been there. I'm not just the God that created you, and I'm not just the God that died on the cross for you. I'm a God that put on your weakness so I know how to complete you. That's beautiful. Have you ever looked at Jesus that way? Instead of being like, God, why ain't you doing it? Why ain't you doing it? And God's like, man, I'm doing this because I need you to see the overall bigger picture and the understanding of why I'm putting you through this. Because sometimes you got to struggle because you won't pray to me or talk to me without it. So Jesus took on this pain. He embraced it, Aaron. He's like, I'm going to delay so I can feel the grief. Because when I take everything to the cross and I say it's finished, I want to be sure I have it completely under control. That's beautiful. That means the stuff that you don't understand and the stuff that you don't think no one understands, God's like, oh, I got you covered. Because I took on your weakness. Ain't that beautiful? So check this out. 
Moreover, check this out. He wanted Mary and Martha to understand that he could do more than just heal the sick. Can I be honest with you today? Jesus wants some of you to know that he can do more than heal the sick and save you. Some of you, that's all you ever ask for. Save, seek, or finance. And God's like, you're just giving me three limits. I mean, I understand the Trinity, but there's more to me than this. Come on, somebody. So he's saying, you know what? I didn't only delay so I can understand the Greek to take it to the cross. But I need you guys to understand that I can do more than heal the sick. And I can do more than to save the lost soul. I can do so much more. It's a beautiful picture here. When we read it and we break it down, we, we see a side of Jesus that we've never been taught. It's, it's, it's just so overwhelming on how much he loves us and what he's trying to show us. I mean, how many of you would have thought that he was trying to show them anything else? Some of you are like, I don't know why you're doing this, God, I don't understand. And God's like, you don't understand because you don't trust me for nothing but this one thing. But you got to trust me in everything. That's beautiful. You know, some of you don't understand why you ain't getting certain things at a certain time. And God's like, I'm delaying that on purpose because you're so focused on that, you missed that I was right here. You missed that I was at Walmart. You missed I was here. You missed me at prayer meeting. You missed me here. Because you were just only focused on your need. And gripping because it was being delayed. And you think, I'm slowed up. And I'm like, you can't have that yet because you ain't even seen this. I'll go, I'll go a little farther. Sometimes what we think we need has got us so blind, we miss the most beautiful thing over to the side. And we think this is more important. God's like, oh, you think you need this, but this is what I'm trying to give you. Can I break it down where you understand? You think you want this Pinto, but I'm fixing to give you a Lamborghini. Yeah. Hello. You think you want this power to put putts up a hill. Come on, somebody. But I'm giving you, I'm fixing to give you some Holy Ghost power that this fly across the country. Come on, somebody. So what he's doing is he's saying, hey, I want you to know that there's more to me than healing the sick. In other words, he's saying, I want you to realize I can actually raise the dead. That's beautiful. We find out in John 11, 7 through 11, John 11, 7 through 11, that sounds like a gas station, don't it? Come on, this is Joe. We find out that after that he saved this to his disciples, he said, let us go to Judea. And, you know, again, everyone say again. And someone asked me the other day, well, we were all studying, and, and the pastor's talking. Right? When pastors talk, man, you're allowed to be there for three hours. I think that right, Brother Memphis. And, and, and uh, they were like, I just never understood why he was saying, let us go to Judea again. Well, let's kind of teach about this. Go to the next verse for me. We find out that the disciples said to him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. Thou goest there again. So what happened is the first time that he went through Judea, People start picking up rocks and throwing at him. So you're like, why is this in the middle of the whole story? Why would we go any farther? Well, Jesus has shown us something here for Christ-like, okay? You go to the next verse, I believe it's 9. Jesus answered and said, Are there not twelve hours in a day? And if any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. Come on. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things he said after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus is sleeping, but I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. Now can I teach what he's doing? He is showing his disciples here, Why are you afraid of going to Judea? We got a bigger purpose here than Judea. You guys are afraid about going to Judea, but we got to go wake up our brother. There's someone that needs an awakening. There's someone that needs a miracle. And you guys are afraid of going through Judea. Just like some of you are afraid to step out into your ministry or afraid to step out with God because you're afraid of the darkness. You're, you're afraid that you're going to get stoned. You're afraid that you're going to fall apart. And Jesus is saying, I'm not sidestepping nothing. I'm going to go right through the midst of the trouble. Can we really teach? Some of you are two-stepping with the devil because you just won't go straight to what God wants you to do. Hello? I didn't get no amens on that one, so that means all of you. Ha! Ah, but, but what I'm being real, I mean, think about this sometimes. We try to find a way around a problem, and then once we get around it, we think we conquer something, but that problem is still... And he's like, I don't care if they try to... I want to talk, can we talk about the love of Jesus? He's like, I don't care if they stole me or not. This is my best friend. 
This is part of my family. They let me in their house. They feed me just as much as I feed them. So he was like, I'm not, I'm not worried about going through a little pain, a little suffering. Because my friend is sleeping. He's waiting on me. Ain't that beautiful, y'all? Why can't we be more like Jesus at this point? Why can't, why can't we just be willing to go right through the rough stuff? I was talking to a couple of my pastor friends, and they're doing big projects, and, and they've like been planning it forever, and one's trying to micro plan it. And, and, and he's like, we're just not like you. You just went head on. I'm like, yeah, it took you 23 years, took us nine. Why not just go for it? Do we not believe Jesus protects us? Do we not know that when we're in God's presence, his presence is our protection? Don't we understand that we're covered by the blood and nothing can cover the bloodline? Church, did we forget that we are covered in the blood? And Jesus is like, no, I'm not going around Judea. I'm going to go through it. Some of you need to understand there's no dancing around your situation. You're just going to have to go. So he does. Although his disciples don't want him to, he does. He said, no, I'm just, I'm going to go face the darkness. I'm going to go right in the middle of all that hostility. Come on, someone. And he done it without flinching. Why? Because he understands there's a bigger purpose. And why am I afraid of the dark if I'm the light? Why are you afraid of the dark if you really have the light inside of you? Why are you so afraid to do what God's called you to do and try something new? Why? I got to say it this way. Why are you so afraid to fall in love and actually feel love for the first time? Why are you so afraid to just put everything on the line and start that new job and start that new business or just branch out and do a ministry? Why are you so Are you not the light in the darkness? Why are you so afraid? Jesus, in this perfect story about his friend, he's shown us what he would go through in depths to get to us. He was willing to go get stoned again in Judea for Lazarus, but yet for us, he went down and conquered death, hell, and the grave. For us. I don't know about you, but that's an amazing kind of love. That's an understanding that I don't have. Because he knew that some of us were going to turn, these, turn our backs on him. He knew some of us would mock him and knew some of us would walk away. But he's like, you know what, I'm still going through it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just powerful. In other words, you ready? He didn't avoid the grief and the facing of the death of his close friends. But see, the problem is, like us, you with me? Like us, Mary and Martha lacked understanding. Lacked understanding. Like us, the intensity, listen to me, listen to me. The, like us, the intensity of their own pain was so great that there was no way in that moment that they could sense what Jesus was really up to. You ever been hurt so bad in that moment that you can't even sense Jesus and you don't even know what he's up to? If you are, that means you're too caught up in your flesh. See, sometimes our flesh overwhelms us so much that fear grips us, and we're like, God, I don't know where you are in this moment. And that's how Mary and Martha were. Their sense of pain, hello, somebody, sense of loss, was so overwhelming to them that they couldn't understand the purpose of what was going on in their life at that moment. Because they were going by their understanding, not God's. Because in their understanding, it's like, how can this be? He was his best friend. Jesus, he eats tacos at my house all the time. Uh, tacos, are, they didn't have them. Just lighten you up. Y'all got serious on me. Huh? He's there all the time. He's always at the house. And how can he do this? I mean, Mary washed his feet. They, they took care of one another. So they couldn't understand. The bigger picture. Can I, can I be real with you? When you get so caught up in your pain and your grief and in your vision and your understanding, you won't ever see God's purpose. Because you're walking him out. You're just too busy caught up in your own realm. We do that when we talk to our loved ones. We do that with our spouses. We, we do that in relationships. We do that with work. 
And we act like we're Christians, but a lot of times we're hurting the people because instead of seeing God's understanding, we're trying to do it with ours. And we can't forgive when we do it in ours. And that's why, with, uh, I got to do this, that's why in relationships, some of you are rocky so bad because, you know, they said they forgive you, and yet you don't know if they really did, and yet they don't know if they really did neither. Because in your understanding, you can't get over why. That was free, that ain't my notes. Hello, somebody. So, in other words, they couldn't get a sense of what Jesus was really up to, Christian. They were just so overwhelmed in their self. But you know something? That's the nature of losing someone or something that we love. The sense of loss can be so profound. Hello? You know, sometimes what's really bad about Christians is sometimes we think we lost something and we give up on ministries, callings, and abilities. And we think we lost it. And God's like, you need to have lost it because I never left you. That was a good one. Come on. See, the pain of the moment vibrates. Listen to me. It vibrates into our stomach and it makes us nauseous. It makes us sick. And then it vibrates into our mind that we begin to hear voices and we can't even tell the difference from our voice and God's voice. And what begins to happen is as it's vibrating through us, it's shaking the Holy Ghost loose. And the next thing you know, all that's happening. You can't turn off your mind because none of that gives you any relief. And your stomach never stops and you never have no relief. And that's why you keep coming and you're praying, God, take it, God, take it. But you don't understand the delay. John 11, 12 through 15 says it this way. Then he said to his disciples, then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep." He shall do well. That's the problem with the church today. Some of you are sleeping giants and you think you're okay. The world don't need you to sleep, church. The, church, the world needs you to raise up and let them know we're awake. So the problem is the church has, I'm going to be real, this is going to get me in trouble, but I don't care. The church has took on the disciples' mentality. Oh, if he's asleep, it's good. How's it good that you're asleep? How's it good? You know, it's like playing baseball, right? Say you got your first hit, got saved, and you got the first base, right? Well, if you took a nap and the next guy got a hit, you wouldn't know when to run the second. And then you want to know why the coach is going, run, 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 little Timmy, run. Right? And it's God saying, get the second, dude. I don't understand why you're yelling at me. And God's like, because you've been sleeping the whole time. I got you to the next base, but you didn't see it because you were just asleep. Then you get to second base. You know, like, oh, praise God, this must be home. And then God knocks a grand slam for you. And then the third base coach is going, come on, come on. And you're like, why is you, why are you yelling at me? And then you want to stop on third base, and the coach is like, go. You ever wonder why the third base coach is always doing that? Because people ain't paying attention. Right, right. Huh? I had, my dad was coach, man. He'd be like, why don't you even... Huh? Because sometimes when we're asleep, we're missing that God's given us and the ability to go home, given us the score. He's given us what we're actually after. Because the church has said it's okay if we're asleep. But then we want to crop about the way the world is, and you want to wake up and fix the world. But hello, church, until you wake up and fix yourself, we can never fix the world. This soon. So check this. How be it Jesus, this is 13. How be it Jesus spoke of death, but they, th they thought that he was speaking and talking or taking of a rest sleep. This is cool. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, you all. <laughs> I'd like to have been there. He's just sleeping. He's just taking a little nap. You know, like, we, you know, like, like we're going to do when you're in the garden. Anyway, you know, come on. And he says, I'm glad for your sake that I was not there. Now hold up. Can we talk? He's saying for their sake, I, I'm glad I wasn't there to fix it right off the bat. Because you wouldn't see the bigger picture. I'm glad I wasn't there because even my fathers wouldn't have seen nothing but waiting on me to make him rise or make him heal. He said, I'm glad I'm not there. 
I'm glad I'm the land because you guys don't even know who I really am and you walk and you talk with me on a daily basis. You ever thought about that? I had to be, that'd be like one of my conversations with my ministers in the room. I'm glad I wasn't there. Y'all been in trouble. Come on. Hello. That's what he's telling them. He's like, hey, I'm glad I wasn't there. And didn't you know that blue? Like, I can see Peter. Why? You don't want to heal your friend? And, I, and this ain't in here, but this is just me. Oh, no, Peter, because you don't realize I'm God. And that's how you guys do sometimes. Who be like, he's asleep? No, he's dead. He's dead. And Jesus is like, I'm glad I wasn't there for you in this situation. I'm glad I wasn't there for you at the beginning of the pain. Because you keep taking me for granted. And that's what we do sometimes because he does it quick. And then we're like, oh, yes, God loves me. And the next time he makes you wait a little bit, you're like, oh. And some of you even go, Lord, forgive me for all the thousands of sins I've done. And God's like, that ain't even what I'm doing. I'm trying to get you to stop taking me for granted. I'm trying, you, trying to get you to see the bigger picture and to have my understanding. Isn't that something? See, by this time, can we really teach? By this time, Jesus finally got to the scene. And it was too late. Lazarus was dead. And he died during the delay. Do you ever feel that way sometimes? While you're waiting on Jesus to come through for you? To meet your need or to answer a prayer? Or it just seems like that mug's just taking forever. Hello? Maybe you're there today. I'm pretty sure you are. Like, what's taking so long? Why ain't this fixed? You know how he is. Jesus will make you wait until you feel like you're dying. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I waited nine years for this church, man. I couldn't understand how we could have an old church with water running in the, in the pastor's office. And we didn't even need a baptistry. We could dunk you in my office if it rained. Come on. I didn't understand that. And I was like, Lord, why are you delaying? And he said, because you won't appreciate it if I don't make you wait. But can you picture the confusion and the frustration of all the friends of Lazarus and the confusion and the frustration? of their family can can you picture that Jesus can you hear him you with me can you hear him Jesus could have done a miracle he could have healed him why ain't he here why ain't he answered us by now why didn't he at least send back one of his disciples or something he didn't even send me a note I thought he loved us I thought he cared for me but he's not here. Don't you feel that way? Are you ready? Lack of understanding will keep us where we don't see the power of Jesus. And I'm going to show you something that's really cool. You ever wonder why he waited four days? Everything else Jesus did, he done it at increments of 12, 8, 3, 40. Hello? Four days. In the Jewish ancient custom, they believed that the spirit would hover around the body for three days. That's why they would come and have like an awake, and that gives you your final goodbyes because they believed that they could hear you there, right? So Jesus showing up on day four meant, in their own belief, he was gone and it was completely over. Gone. Over. Can you hear Martha cry out? John eleven twenty one. 21. Lord, if you'd have been here, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't be dead. I'm just croaking it, y'all. I'm just doing my thing. My brother had not died. If you'd have been here, Lord, my brother would still be. Man, don't you feel that way sometimes? Lord, if you'd have been here, I'd have been able to handle this. Lord, if you'd have been here, this has been took care of. Lord, if you'd have been here, this, my marriage would have been saved. If you'd have been here, Lord, if you'd have been, if you'd have been, and God's like, well, I never leave or forsake you all. Hello. But can you hear her pain? Can you hear her cry? Huh? God, Jesus! Where were you? Why ain't you done nothing? Can I tell you what she did? She done something that we need to learn to do. She didn't attempt to rationalize her feelings or to explain her pain. She just straight told him how she felt. And that's the problem with some of you. You rationalize your needs. 
you rationalize your hurt and your pain. Oh, he hurt me. God's like, come on, I'm God. I know what happened. Be more real with me. Stop doing the blame game. She was just straight honest. God! Isn't it strange that Jesus answers people that way? Huh? Come on, somebody. Think about it. You know, it's strange enough that God always seems to be partial to people who speak to him with this straight honesty. Can I, can I ask you something? When you pray, are you really honest or are you like trying to make it sound good like God don't already know? Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. It's like when you were a kid and your mom asked you something. You knew you were caught because your mama asked you. But you'd be like, now, hey, wait, before you get on to me, Mom, uh, uh, it was Mike's fault. Mike told me to do it. Or I wouldn't have done this if, if Pam would have been a better sister. <laughs> She's not in the house. And, um, right? That's how we do, right? Well, we do the same thing with God. Why can't we just be forward? He already knows you sin. He already knows you messed up. He already knows you're hurting. Well, Lord, I'm, I'm hurting. Lord, I just have a little bit of hurt. I have a hard time coming to church because, you know, them people down the road. And people down the road just hurt me real bad, Lord. And I just don't like it. You know I'm right, church. And God's like, I didn't ask you to give me a five-hour story. I'm God. I'm the one that put the people there. Hello, part of your delay. Hello? Do you know that they're talking behind my back? I'm talking about me now. Do you know that they're talking behind my back? Lord, I'm so tired. They're supposed to be ministers. They keep talking behind my back. And God's like, duh, I put them there. I don't even answer God. Why? Why would you do that? Why would you put me to that pain? Hello? Yeah. I was like, I just wanted you to know how I felt. And now you know better to do it behind their back. His understanding. Saying. John 11 and 25 says this. Jesus told her, I am what the resurrection and I am the life. He that believeth in me, though we're dead, yet shall be. Okay, let's just, let's just stop here. He says, I am the life. Hello? She's crying out to him. He goes, you want an answer? You want an answer? I am the life. I am the resurrection. Can we really break it down? In other words, he's saying, I thought we were friends. You're griping about my friendship with you. What about mine and your relationship? I thought you believed in me that I was God. I thought you believed in me that I was do, able to do all things. Oh, what, you want to gripe about me and ask about my friendship and my loyalty? What about your loyalty? Yeah. Oh, come on. I told you I am the resurrection and the life. But yet you st you're questioning me. You ever thought about that? Ain't that something? Makes you think about how you talk to God. Don't come on, somebody. Come on. This is crazy. It's me. So I want you to understand this. Jesus was no different to the pain of his friends than we are. It hurts when your friends do something. It hurts when family does something. I know we're talking about loss in the, in the, in the sermon, but come on, man. Let's cover every area. It hurts. But look at what Jesus does. Right, this is still cool. John 11, 35. If you need a verse that you can quote, here you go. Jesus wept. i got a funny story on this one. My dad used to make us stand up and quote scriptures on Sunday. Um, my brother got told it was his Sunday. And he, the only one he ever could quote was this one. I'm pretty sure he'd done it 30-something times. Never the same. But anyway, check out what Jesus did. Everyone say, Jesus wept. So that means Jesus had emotions for Lazarus? Hold up. Can we, can, we, can we really teach where you don't think God loves you? You don't understand why everything's so difficult and you're so busy bashing God that you ever think that he's weeping over you? And he ain't weeping over your circumstances, but he's weeping over you because of your unbelief? How you don't believe he is the resurrection? And how you don't believe he is the life? Or you don't believe he can get you out of that circumstance? What's so cool here is that the weeping of Jesus was so profound that the crowd said in the next verse, they said, the Jews said, behold how he loved. They, had, they made one mistake here. They did love in past tense. But he loves you even after death. Come on, church. See, I want you to get here, and this is where everything changes. When he got to Martha, and when he got to doing something, he was like every other great teacher. 
Jesus did not attempt to answer the question with answers, but most of you know great teachers always ask you more questions. Hello. And that would make the listener be forced to see the truth inside themselves. Did you hear me? That means when you're asking why, God, why, why, God's like, let me give you some other Christians. Why ain't you seen what I'm doing? Why ain't you so close to me that you know the why? Why ain't you so close to me that you understand my understanding? I'm asking you, church, why? Why don't you see what he's doing? Why can't you feel him in that moment? Why are you second-guessing what he's doing for you? Can't you see what he's really doing in the bigger picture? You all with me? Give me five more minutes. Here's a hand. I'll take all of them. Here we go. Check this out. So he asked Martha this in 37. Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus, therefore, agree and moan. Don't you, didn't you know he moans at you sometimes? Hello. I mean, can you pick, you with me? Yeah. Can you picture Jesus in that room? He's like, I'm here to raise him from the dead, but you all gripping about me because I didn't heal him. You wanted me here, but you didn't want me here for this circumstance. You wanted me here for that circumstance. Yeah. Yeah, come on. And that's how some of you are. Oh, talking to you, church. You want him here when you think you're right, but when he proves you're wrong and it needs to be handled this way, you don't want him there. Well, if you'd have been here, this would have been different. If you'd have handled that, it'd have been different. God's like, well, no, no, you don't pick when I show up. I show up when I need to be there. I said I'll keep you sustained. I didn't say I'd baby you. Hello? Could this man not open the eyes of the blind and have caused even this man so he should not have died? Jesus groaned in himself. Cometh through the grave. I like to be in there, man. I bet that was some. Because if he groans like me, I think it's in myself, but it's out loud. Mm -mm -mm. Hello? What are you doing that makes him grieve when you don't have belief that he's taking care of your circumstance? You don't believe he's going to fix things? You don't believe he's going to turn your life around? Do you really not think that? And do you realize when you go against your own belief and you don't have faith in him, he's like, mm, I'm going to do it anyway, but mmm. I thought you loved me. Mm. You, you ever had your mama growl at you? My dad just yelled at me, but let's talk about mamas. Amen? Huh? There's times that my, I do something, my mama, mm. and you know, I'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing her button. So I do it again. She goes, mm. and then she said, like, I'm going to tell your dad. I'd be like, okay. But think about that. Did you guys realize that God loves you so much that he has feelings for you that he reaps and then he groans because of your lack of faith? He's like, man, I cry for you all morning. Now listen to you. <clears throat> Lack of faith. I'm here. You so, okay, Lord, I hear you. This is what they were really doing. They were more ready to see the miracle than seeing the miracle maker. And some of you are more worried about the miracle to get you out of your mess than to just seek the one that does the miracles. Oh, you gotta get me out of here. God, you gotta get me out of here. And God's like, man, this ain't even your problem. I'm here for you. Can we really teach that? He wasn't really there for Lazarus. He was there for all the unbelief. Come on. Jesus said, I love this. And now I think he said this with a little aggravation. Take away the stone. Take, move it. Come on, somebody. Come on. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Are you ready? Lord. By this time, he stinketh. <laughs> He's been dead four days. And the reason not four days is there. They believed in ancient times that the body would hover for three. So they even believed he could be God as long as the spirit was hovering. But after four days, they didn't even have enough belief. Oh, low church. How many of you ever told God he took too long, it stinketh? Uh, Lord, you took too long to get my marriage back. You took too long to get me healed. You took too long. Lord, I smell, I smell. And God's like, I know you smell because I ain't, I ain't smelled a good fragrance to worship off you in months. Bible says that when we praise and when we do that, that we have an aroma that God loves. <laughs> but some of you guys are like, come on, stinky, repent. I'm being real. 
This is, this is good. This is real. You're not praising him. You're not worshiping him. You're like, God, it took too long. I don't even, some of you even like this. It must not have been God or it happened quicker. Oh, my goodness. Come on. There's no time limit with God. He's God. Jesus said unto her, I love this. I, he said unto her, said I not to thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou wouldst see the what? He was telling her, it ain't about him getting healed. It ain't even about him being raised. It's about going find God. So what you're going through in your sickness, in your disability, in your grief, in your in whatever you're facing, it ain't about you, selfish. It's about glorifying God. Can we really be real? He thought so much of you that he knew you could handle it. Because he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what's your crying spilt milk over? He's saying, I'll put that on you because I designed you to handle that. But you acting like a baby. Martha, Mary, I let your brother die because you can handle this. I know you can handle it because I spent so much time with you. Stop your whining. You're in a, you have, if you're going through some struggles and some pains and some, you have an opportunity to glorify God. That's different, y'all. We only want to praise Him when it's, oh, it's over. And God's like, why can't you praise me during it? Because I'll pitch you through that to glorify God. We think we sinned. We think we messed up. We think we screwed up. And God's like, no, I did this to show you how much I believe in you. This is for you to glorify me. But we won and we cry and we argue. Is it always this bad serving God? Honey, he loves you so much, he's giving you opportunity to glorify him like no one's ever seen. And you're over here like, oh, so caught up in an emotion. So caught up in your own pain and your own grief that you can't even see what God's really fixing to do. That's where Martha was. It's probably where you are. By fully entering into the moment, Jesus first embraced a deep understanding of his people around him. That's so beautiful, man. But he had to come, he had to come to give them a different kind of understanding. Did you catch that? He pit them through that circumstance so they would have a different understanding of who he really is. And that's where most of you are today. You have your little painted picture and watercolors of how you think God is. But God said, we don't color in watercolors because they fade away. You're supposed to be painted in the blood. Mary and Martha, though their grief was great, you hear me? They got to see the first recipient on earth of the resurrection. You guys getting that? They got to see firsthand so they would understand the bigger picture going down the road when they got to Jesus' tomb and it was empty. Hey, don't panic because you remember what I did for Lazarus? I had to pitch you through that moment so you would understand the next moment to come. And that's what he does. Pitch you through these moments so you have a greater understanding of the next moment. They were the first to see a body resurrection and the first to see that Jesus wasn't in the tomb no more. And I bet if they were here the day, they'd tell you every bit of that pain and grief was worth it all. Because when he raised my brother, there was no doubt that I knew he raised himself. Let's get to Lazarus real quick. 
all of a sudden speaking, listen, listen, speaking with the same authority as the one that created the heavens and the earth. Oh, come on. All of a sudden, with a thundering voice, Lazarus, come forth. That's powerful, y'all. Lazarus, come forth. He's dead, y'all. You all agree? But he knew him by name because if he just said come forth, that real one would have came out of that grave. But he knew him by name and loved him so much that he's like, no, nah, I just want Lazarus at this moment. Can we be real? He's calling some of you by name right now. He's calling you by name. Someone wants me to call their name so you know it's God. Hey, that was your answer. I'm not doing it. He's calling you by name. And he said, get out of that stinky tomb. I let you go in there for a reason. I wanted you to realize there's more to me than this forgiven sin and for healing you. I wanted you to realize I am the life. I wanted you to know. I want to end towards the end like this. You ready? 11, 44 through 45 says, and the dead came forth. Ain't that awesome? Bound hand and foot in grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Come on. If you don't know what the napkin means, when Jesus was in the grave, he folded the napkin, which symbolizes in Jewish custom, I'm coming back. Come on, somebody. Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. Everyone say, loose him. Loose him. Let it go. All right, you ready? He's calling you today to show you a different understanding of what you're going through. Hello. But it's up to you to get your own grave clothes off. It's up to you to allow someone to remove that off of you. That's beautiful. Because he could have came back with nothing on him. But he needed Martha and Mary to see. You want to see your miracle? You want to see the life that I just produce? Unwrap it. Can we really, can we really teach? After three days, your body shrivels up. His, front, his fingernails would have been grown because his skin would have crawled back. His hair would have been all bushy. Come on, somebody. He would have not only stunk, but it would have been bad. But he made them unwrap the miracle that they asked for. You know why? Because sometimes it's just like the patient, it's just like waiting. Sometimes he makes you unwrap it so you can enjoy it even better. Can you see Lazarus? I'm here, God. Can we really teach? I'm here, God. You called me here, but some people's unbelief still got me wrapped up. Some people's doubt still had me tied. And Jesus is like, all right, I called him forth. I gave him, I gave him life, but it's up, to, it's to, up to you to unwrap your unbelief. It's up to you to unwrap some new faith. It's up to you. Can you see Martha and Mary? Can we teach? All that pain and all that agony. Now all of a sudden, Lazarus? La Lazarus? Man, he bounced out like a mummy. You know what I'm saying? Lazarus? Lazarus. Lazarus in there. Hmm? Hurry up. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Huh? Can, can we teach? Can we teach? Mm-hmm. Lazarus is saying, hurry up. So that means once we get our miracle, it ain't just going to all at once. It's going to take the same amount of waiting time to unwrap it. That's good. And the untied him. But the napkin was still on his face so it couldn't talk. They unwrapped the first world and clothes off of him. Unwrapped it again. Now, now the miracle's got a little motion. Now they can see he is the life giver. Come on, somebody. And can you see when they finally got to his face, they took off the napkin? That death didn't even mark him. There's always an understanding of why we wait and why we're gonna unwrap it. Come on. So here we go. Jesus knew, you ready? Jesus knew that if he didn't put them through all that stuff, they would never understand the bigger purpose. Because all they were doing was understanding through their pain, understanding through their grief, understanding through their loss. Hello. But as Christians, we're not supposed to have an understanding through them. 
our understanding has to come through God. He knew, being a rabbi, that I could teach the best lesson ever and they'll never get who I really am. But if I take something they love, listen, if I take something they love, something that they cherish so much, if I take it and I make them wait and wonder what I'm doing, they'll understand who I am when I bring it back to life. So here we go. Now you understand what God can do with your struggles. Now you understand or have an understanding of why God has you going through struggles. Because you're not seeing the full image of God. You're just seeing what you want at that moment. And God's like, I got bigger plans. I got bigger purposes. Isn't that awesome? He lets you go through these struggles because you can have an understanding. Him. And the other reason is so you can have some clarity. Some clarity of who God is. Hi everyone, Cornbread Chris Heineken here, of course, representing Resonate the Sound of Resonate Church. And we will send a special shout out and a thank you for your support for watching us each and every week. Whether it's here, whether it's on syndication or YouTube or simulcast, or hey, whether you're joining us live right here at Resonate Church, thank you so much for your support. Now, for those of you who are saying that hey, you know, Cornbread, hey, Resonate Church, hey, we love what you guys are doing, man. We love that you that you're promoting Jesus. That hey, we are, you know, we've been blessed by your ministry. You know, we've been blessed by your church. But hey, we want to turn around and bless you. How can we do that? Well, we got the answer. Go to our website, resonatechurchar.org. Go there, go to the top of the page, the top right hand side of the page. Click on, on the word giving. Yes, it's a link. Click there. It'll take you to a brand new page. Yes, the word's given. Click it. It'll take you to a brand new page. When you scroll down, you have four options. Those four options are. If you join us live right here at Resonate at 414 County Road 4021, right off Highway 1 in Stadium, great. Best way to do it. Option number two. If you want to give online, click that tab link. And of course, you're seeing it right here on your screen. Click that top link, which is right there. And hey, you have a whole lot of options that you can choose from. So if you want to give online, click the top link and make sure that you literally specify where you want your gift going towards. Option number three, your cell phone. Hey, you want to give courtesy of your cell phone? Guess what? Text the word give to the number that you see on your screen. It's, it's a little deal called text to give. Text the word GIVE to the number that you see right there on your screen. Option number four, mail. Hey, if you want to mail, if you want to mail your contributions to us, whether it's check or money order, hey, you can do that with the address on your screen. But let us stress this. If you do check or money order, please make them payable to Resonate Church. I'm going to repeat that. If you are literally giving courtesy of a check or money order, please make the check or money order payable to Resonate Church. And there are your four options, ladies and gentlemen. And if you want more info, hey, all you got to do is go to ResonateChurchAR.org for all the details. Resonate is bumping every every Sunday, Wednesday. Hey, what about, hey, what about our whole entire church? You know, all we do is you know we praise God, we resonate Jesus. But hey, think about this: it's not just for everybody we meet; it's for everybody. Come join us. 10 a.m. Sunday morning. Come resonate. Wednesday afternoon at five o'clock. Wednesday. Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. A solid foundation in the men's ministries of resonance.
across the bridge with us with our women's ministry. All the kids' ministries, yes. All the kids can have fun. So can you. We can't wait to see you join us. 418 County Road 4021. That's right out of Highway 1 the Stadium. And uh, guess what? We'll see you there. Hey, and until we see you right here at Resonate, show love and give peace. Resonate Jesus. Jesus. Pastor, thank you very much. You know, understanding and the source of understanding doesn't come from us. It comes from God. You know, a lot of times we need to start stop looking at everything in a physical, you know, with that physical eyesight. You know that's important. But what's more important than the physical eyesight is the spiritual eyesight. And with the spiritual eyesight, you can see a whole lot more than you would your physical eyesight. Both eyesights are important, but the spiritual is even more important. And also realize this, you know, you can't fix the world. And I, I love everything you said. You can't fix the world without fixing yourself. And that's some hard hidden advice that I know that a lot of places and a lot of churches in particular don't want to hear. But you can't expect the world to change if you can't change for a positive, if you cannot change yourself for the positive. Because it's all about glorifying God. It, but to those of you that are underneath the sound of my voice. Now, tonight's episode truly confirms it. God believes in you. Let me repeat that one more time. God believes in you. What excuses are there? There are no excuses. God believes in you. Please take that to heart because it's all about glorifying, expanding, magnifying and resonating his name everywhere but you can't do it everywhere until you start right here you can't do it out there until you start right here thank you so much for watching god thank you so much for letting us resonate your sound we're right back here next thursday night 9 p.m eastern standard time until then, for our senior lead pastors, Brian and Carmen Adams, for our entire staff and everyone here at Resonate, I'm Chris Honecker. We do indeed say to you, show love, give peace, oh yeah, Resonate Jesus, join us next Thursday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a good night, everybody.